Hey, I am Lane. I'm the student pastor here at Christian Fellowship of the Forge is the little name of our group. Uh, so if you're a student in here, you've never been back there on Wednesday nights, uh, come back there on Wednesday nights. We have a good time. Um, real quick, we, I put all my notes up on the, the YouVersion Bible app. If you have your phones out and you'd like to follow along that way, you can follow along. And it has all the verses and everything that you need. Or you can just go to the instructions on the screen. Um, I wanted to take a little bit to say thanks to all of you who have, um, in the past few months, donated uh, for camp or have prayed for our kids to go to camp. We have had truly, over the past few years that we've gone, life-changing experiences with these, with these kids. They, they've come into contact with God. It, it's been incredible to see. And uh, I, I, it couldn't happen without you. So I wanted to, from the bottom of my heart, just say thank you uh, for letting me be a part of that and for investing in the next generation. And I hope to someday tell you uh, some stories about some of the things that have happened at camp. But this morning, I just want to share with you one, and it is not something you're expecting to hear. (laughs) So um, what's cool about camp isn't just like the services or the small groups, the things that happen there. It's it's the little stuff that bond people together. You know, like, like a life group, you get close enough to each other for a week and you just have that connection or something happens and you all do that collective, like look at each other, like you see what's going on right here. And there is nothing that brought us closer as a group last year than what happened at a Chick-fil-A in Mississippi. Um, um, okay. So on the way there and on the way back, we like to eat at the same Chick-fil-A in Mississippi because it's kind of halfway in between both places. So that's what we like to do, but there's no really good way ever to bring in 45 kids into Chick-fil-A. I honestly, Chick-fil-A, they know how busy they are. Why do they keep making their buildings so small all the time? You can't fit that many people in there. It's packed all the time. I don't know. Maybe take away the play place. I can't even go up there anyway, legally. But um, there's no good way. Okay, so I remember getting there on the way back from camp last year into this Chick-fil-A. We're all packed in. All 45 of us are in line. I'm feeling good. I'm hungry. um, And, you know, I'm just, it's been a good week. I'm excited to get food. And then there's this lady who comes in at the very back. And I think the word that should be used to describe her, if you've heard of it, is hangry. Um, and to where she's like so hungry that it hurts her, that she's angry about it. I like to think that, that for her, maybe she was hungry an hour ago. And that she liked, she was like, man, I should really go get some food. But then her favorite Netflix show came on. And she was like, well, I can't pause this. Yes, honey, you can. But she decided not to. She was like, I'm just going to watch this for a little bit. And by the time she looks at her clock, she's like, oh, my God, I need to go get something fast. So she's like, what's fast? Chick-fil-A, obviously, they roll out chicken so quick. So she gets her daughter, yes, her daughter. And she puts her in the car, and they drive to the Chick-fil-A. And you can imagine her dismay when she sees the line and the drive through is just extending out into the street, right? And she's just like, I just wanted some quick chicken, right? So, But the parking lot's empty. She decides she's going to go inside. She's going to try her luck there. And my goodness, her face when she opens the doors and she sees and smells 45 teenagers in front of her. So upset. She She was irate the moment she came in the door. She was mad. Okay, and I want, to preface, I want to preface this by saying our kids handled this perfectly. Kids, you, you did good. You represented Jesus the best way that you could. You handled this. They did nothing wrong. So I have to say that so you're not going to leave here this morning saying, my God, I'll never donate to children's camp, kids camp again. These students are causing a ruckus at Chick-fil-A. So she was angry when she came in. We all finally get our food. We're all sitting down. And uh, I'm sitting outside eating my food, and uh, one of our kids comes and taps me on the shoulder and was just like, hey, this lady really wants to talk to you. And I was like, what lady? So they direct me inside uh, to the woman, and I knelt down by the table next to her, try to see what was going on, and she started telling me all of the problems that my kids have caused her that day. Um, See, across the restaurant at some point, I don't know, I was outside, a kid made a noise, The kids make after they drink soda? They burped? We all burp, it's okay. 
So I, I know it's habit. Sometimes I get in trouble for it. Mom, if you're watching, I still burp out loud. I'm sorry. Uh, this lady was very upset that that happened. Okay. And not only that, she had a whole slew of issues. Okay. So she heard the burp. She got angry. She said something to one of our students. Our students, you know, high off of that feeling that they get from camp. They're just like, man, I'm sorry. I want to tell everybody about Jesus. I want to tell everybody that Jesus loves them. They're like, ma'am, I'm truly sorry. Uh, I, it won't happen again. Well, that didn't satisfy her. So um, there was another student who came around to the table, understanding that she was visibly still upset, and was just like, hey, I'm sorry about what happened. I just wanted to apologize, and that's it. Walked away. There was another kid, completely unrelated to the burping incident, who came up to her and just say, hey, I like your hair. They're feeling good about themselves. This lady hated all of that. <laughs> Every single bit of that, she was just like listing as grievances against our group. And she was just foaming at the mouth with how angry she was. Uh, and then topped the whole thing off by saying, and when I was in line, your kids, a few of them, didn't have shoes on. And I'm going to call the police. <laughs> And I was like, lady, if you just knew what happened at camp, you'd just be thankful that they're alive in the building. I don't care if they're missing their shoes. At least they're here. Jeez. So, you know, she eventually leaves after uh, a few obscene gestures to the entire group uh, with her daughter next to her. Yes. She leaves. There's just difficult people in the world. Can we agree on that? But she's gone. She's out of there. No, she's not. We're on the bus ride home. When she is so furious that she found out uh, our group, see, we were all wearing matching t-shirts. She found out our group on Facebook. She messaged the Forge Facebook page, and she was telling them the exact same thing that she told me, uh, just furious typing. I want something to be done about this. And they're like, well, what, what could we do to make this right? And she's like, never come to my state again. Never come to Mississippi. Cancel the trip next year. And I was like, ma'am, that's going to be a hard thing to police. I don't know if there's something I could do about that. She wasn't happy with that answer. So she messaged the boss of the forge, which is Christian Fellowship, told them the exact same story. I actually had a screenshot of my face from the forge Facebook page. She's like, I talked to this gentleman and he did absolutely nothing about it. Even though I tried my hardest to apologize to her. And we were like, ma'am, what do you want to see done about this? I'm so sorry. And she's like, fire him. And Christian Fellowship responded, done. <laughs> oh, man. Not knowing all the while I was the one running both Facebook pages. I got her, man. <laughs> look, look, look. That last bit wasn't true. That was an idea that Jonathan wanted to say, say, hey, we're hiring a new youth pastor. We, we did make things better, though, with her. But there's difficult people out there in the world, Right? There are difficult people. And look, what did us in was the matching shirts that we all had. And when you go out into the world, you're not always going to have the matching Christian Fellowship t-shirts to show who you belong to. You're not always going to have the verses on your shirt that show who you belong to. But when you leave here, if you claim to know who Jesus is, you are representing Jesus wherever it is you go. To normal people and difficult people alike. You're representing Jesus when you're in line at Chick-fil-A and when you're the crazy person behind the counter at Chick-fil-A just yelling at people. And I want to talk to the people who just believe in Jesus just for one second. Because if you aren't a Christian, I, I don't want you to tune out. I want you to keep listening. Uh, I want to talk to you in a bit. But church, we're representing Jesus everywhere we go. And, and it might be an accurate assumption, I think, to say that we might not always be doing a good job at that. Some of our behaviors might have left a bad taste in the mouths of others, and we haven't always acted like Jesus. Sure, it's really easy here in the church, but this is a place that God made literally to display his peace among diversity to the world. So yeah, it's going to be easy here. But what about when it comes to your workplace? When it comes to your job, are you representing Jesus there? And I'm not just talking about your work friends. I'm talking about the person at work who annoys the heck out of you. I'm talking about the, the, the family member that you warn your kids about before you go to that family reunion, okay? You know who I'm talking about. Uh, you guys, are you guys loving the unlovable? Because we represent Jesus to everyone who sees us, to the waitress at the restaurant who's slow, messing up orders constantly on her phone, all the way to the Facebook friend who is posting completely differing uh, political opinions than you are. 
All of us bear the image of Christ, but I'm not always certain that that image is one that needs to be shown to the world. I want you to do this with me real quick, and I don't want you to just sit there and stare at me. Just really do this. I want you to think of a person, and I could just say the word difficult, and it would come into your head. I want you to picture a person, get a good, clear picture of, of somebody who just is so difficult to love. Maybe it is a coworker, maybe it is a, a family member or a Facebook friend. Heck, it might even be someone in the room today, but don't point at them. Um, <laughs> but I want you to ask this question, and I want you to be completely honest with yourself. If the only way that person could see the character of Jesus was through me, would they know him? If the only way that person could see the character of Jesus was through me, would they know who he is? And I know that if you're really thinking about this, that some of your hearts just sank because you know the answer to that question. And you know that you haven't been doing the best job that you can. And I'm not trying to shame you, honestly, because it's a very difficult thing to do. It's, it's hard to love people who are difficult to love. And that's why we're having this conversation. And there's a guy named, uh, in the Bible named Luke who wrote about a time where Jesus made the choice to love somebody who is difficult, something he does all the time. And no matter how many times I read this, this passage, it, it always just seems to stick out to me. It's a good representation of a few groups of people who may be in the room today. For those of you who may not have a personal relationship with Jesus, it shows how Jesus responds to you, not how Jesus' followers respond to you, because as we might have pointed out, that's not always the exact same thing. And for the church members, the Jesus followers... It shows how you should treat difficult people. Because when it comes down to it, being a Christian means being like Jesus, right? It literally means just that, the actual name Christian. They didn't have a name for that group of people who are going and just loving people radically after Jesus left. They didn't have a name, so they backhandedly called them little Christs. And that's how we get the word Christian. That's how they lumped them all together. These are just people trying to be like Jesus. And that's the name that we all have for ourselves today. So church, I want you to see in this passage, not just how Jesus responds to a difficult person, but a despised person, a person who's disliked across the board. And I want you, if you're in here and you don't know Jesus or you haven't had a good picture of him, again, I want you to see how Jesus responds to you. So Luke chapter 19, there's going to be the verses on the screen where you can follow along on your phone or Bible. Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. There was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region, tax collector in the region, and he had become very rich. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd, so he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass that way. Now you have to understand, uh, this dude named Zacchaeus is the difficult person in our story, and when I say he was universally hated, I cannot state that enough. You think difficult person, in your head, it's Zacchaeus, okay, because he was a tax collector, and people hated tax collectors, all right, especially Jewish people, because Jewish people not only had to pay taxes to, uh, according to the Mosaic law, but they eventually, Rome came in and, and took over Jericho, and then Rome hired people to go collect the taxes for their people. So the Jewish people were like, this isn't right. We don't feel like it's, it's good for us to pay taxes again to someone. We don't even want this government here. And, and they, they hated tax collectors. They especially hated Jewish tax collectors which was exactly what Zacchaeus was because he was seen as a traitor. He was seen as somebody who was taking money out of his own people's pockets because the way that they made money back then was to uh, collect the tax, but tell them it was a little bit higher than what it actually was so they could skim off the top. And because Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector, you could see that he was at the very, very top of the pyramid and likely even told the people under him that he had to charge more so they could not only, he could not only take a cut of the people he went to visit, but from his own people as well, those who were under him. He was hated, man. He was, he was a traitor. He was an outcast. And I think because of all the things that Zacchaeus had done in his life and, and the path that he had chosen, he was also very lonely. He made a mess out of his life, and I'm sure he feels like some of you in here might feel today, defeated or hopeless or, or void of happiness. The culmination of his choices and mistakes brought him to a very, very low place. And even though he was rich, he was a man who was still searching for a lot more. And you can see that in this verse, because I'm sure he started asking himself stuff like this. Is, is, is this all that there is for me? Like, I've acquired all these riches. I have money, but... Man, is this, it? is this my purpose in life? Or is there greater things out there for me? Is this all that there is to it? 
And then he heard that Jesus was coming to town. And he knew who, was, who this was because he'd heard about him. I mean, Jesus was a dude who was going around and doing crazy, unheard of things. Like he was healing people. He was creating this mass following around him so big that the Roman government was terrified that they were going to use him to take over Rome. So, the, I mean, his name was well known. Even the people who didn't necessarily believe that he was the Savior. And Zacchaeus thought to himself, if I could just catch a glimpse if I could just see this guy for myself, he turned things around for so many people. Maybe he can do the same for me. So he decided to go check it out for himself and ended up climbing up into a tree just to catch a glimpse of Jesus. And guys, I really, really want to be transparent with you this morning and real with you this morning. There are a lot of people out there who are desperately searching for answers who are desperate. There's people who are difficult to love, but it may be simply because of the things that they've done in their life have led them to that place. Some of the things that they they don't like how they're feeling, they might not show it on the outside, but inside they are hurting, they are questioning, they're wondering, is there anything out there for me? Is there hope for me? Yes, even the difficult person you pictured earlier might be thinking those things, and they've heard about Jesus, so they've just tried to catch a glimpse of him. Zacchaeus was bold enough to climb up into a tree to see for himself, but some won't be that brave. Some people, some of your coworkers, some of your family members might be brave enough to walk through those doors one Sunday morning, but some won't. Some might never muster up that courage to come into this building, but they still want to get just a look at Jesus because they've heard that he can change their life. He's heard of the things that he can do. Now, can you imagine... If the only thing that they saw was you, knowing that you're a follower of Jesus, how do you think that that left them? Did that glimpse of Jesus do him justice? Verse 5 says this, when Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and he called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. I want to stop here because I want you to imagine the shock that he might have felt because he climbed all the way up in the tree. He risked embarrassment uh, to do so. And, and, and this guy that he just wanted to catch a glimpse of looks up and sees him. And he calls him out by name. And that what has to be running through Zacchaeus' mind is the only way that he knows me is because my reputation went before me. Right? People have probably told him how terrible I am. The only way he can know my name is because he, he wants to call me out. He has to punish me. Right? If this is the Son of God, that's what I deserve. Right? He, he probably had so much fear in his heart. When, when he heard his own name come from the mouth of Jesus, ooh, I can't imagine how, how his stomach must have dropped. But then Jesus said something that's unheard of. He, he didn't shout accusations at Zacchaeus. He, he didn't convict him. He didn't point out his flaws. He didn't say, Zacchaeus, you need to come down here because this is all of the things that you've been doing wrong. He pursued him. <laughs> He, he, he called him by name so he can have a friendship with him, so he can show love to him. Now, the, even in Jewish culture today, it's unheard of to invite somebody over for a meal unless you want to get into a deeper friendship with that person. And this is exactly what Jesus was doing. He wasn't calling him down so he could tell him all the things that he did wrong. He said, I want to come over to your house because I want to get to know you. I want to show you that, that you're, you haven't done enough bad to keep me away from you. And I want you to imagine the excitement that Zacchaeus had up in that tree, the relief that he felt, or the hope that he felt. Verse 6 says, He quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house with great excitement and joy, but the people were displeased. He's gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. And I want you to look at what happens next, because this is, it's been a conversation that we've had in the staff the past few weeks, because you can't ignore sin, Right? I mean, it's, it's a barrier that goes up between you and God. We, we can't ignore that. It has to be pointed out, right? But too often, I think that we've taken it upon ourselves to be the ones who point that out. We've looked at the difficult person and decided that we were going to be the judge, the jury, and the executioner. But look what happens. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I'll give half my wealth to the poor, Lord. And, and if I've cheated people on their taxes, I'll give them back four times as much. Did you see it? Maybe that difficult person doesn't need you there to point out all the reasons that they're terrible. Could the presence of Jesus alone be all that it needs to cause the heart to turn? The Bible doesn't say that Jesus accused them. 
It doesn't say that he mentioned anything. It simply says this, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord. Maybe repentance is just what happens when something is imperfect as humanity gets close enough to something as perfect as Jesus. Verse 9 says this, Jesus responded, salvation has come to this home today. For this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save those who are lost. The son of man came to seek and to save those who are, who are lost. And somewhere along the way, I think that the church has forgotten that purpose. I was in Las Vegas earlier this year. Oh, yes, pastors have heard of and actually been to <laughs> Las Vegas. Um, and I remember what, what we do is the Scruggs family on vacations. We love to go eat. So um, in order to eat more, you have to walk more. Um, so we were walking from <laughs> restaurant to restaurant uh, down the strip uh, where all the casinos and everything are. And I remember seeing uh, in, in one of the busy streets that we had to cross, uh, there was a lot of people there. I remember seeing a street preacher off to the side um, standing on one of those little boxes. I don't know how they all find the same boxes, but that's, that doesn't matter. Um, but he was standing there, and he had his sign, he had his Bible open, had his little megaphone, and he was shouting the normal stuff that you hear street preachers yell, you know, you need to repent, you're all sinners, you're all going to hell, you need to, you know, love Jesus. Um, and I remember nobody was paying him any attention. And I remember, like, seeing his shoulders slump a little bit, and you could, like, feel the frustration because if no one was listening. Not that no one was listening to his message, but no one was, like, paying him any mind at all. And I remember he just stopped preaching, and he shouted, is anyone listening to me? And then somebody who was walking in the crowd with us without hesitation just said, no. But maybe the church needs to stop screaming at the world what they're doing wrong and need to start doing something about it. Because if you want to change the hearts and the lives of the people in this world, your Facebook posts aren't going to do that. Your political views aren't going to do that. Your arguments, your judgments, I'm not going to do it. The only thing that is strong enough to transform even the hardest of hearts is love. And if you walk away with nothing else this morning, I want you to walk away with these three words. Choose to love. Choose to love. Some of you might not be an easy thing, and some of the people that you had pictured in your mind, it might not be an easy thing. But think for the next 30 seconds, if I just loved this person, what would happen? If, if instead you chose not to be annoyed with your coworker, your family friend, your, your family member, what if instead you chose to love them? What if instead of, of, of pointing out their, all their flaws and the things that were wrong with them, you chose to do what Jesus did? Can you imagine what would start to happen? Because when you choose to show his love, you choose to show who Jesus is. Because God is love. Love. 